knowing your client, knowing what's going to hit them, not just intellectually, but emotionally, you, you, that, that's essential. And also trying to figure out, okay, what can we bring that nobody else can bring? Business of Architecture, episode 187. Hello, I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the podcast for architects, where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. I'd like to invite you to discover how to double your architecture from income and create your dream practice of freedom and impact by downloading my free four-part architecture firm profit map. As a podcast listener, you can get instant access by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today is the second half of my interview with guest Hillary Weinstein, an expert in the area of communication, speaking, and presentation skills for architects. She's the author of two books, Selection Success and More Selection Success, on how you can do your best in a situation where you are competing in a presentation setting. In today's show, you'll discover how to be a better communicator and a concept that Hillary calls high impact communication. Now, let's get down to business. Hillary, welcome back to Business of Architecture. Thank you so much. Now, on your website, your website is the URL is highimpactcommunication.com. Tell me about what do you consider to be high impact communication? Well, high impact communication is communication that is effective, it's impactful, and that it has the desired effect on others. The reason why we communicate to others is partially to make a connection, but partially to take something that's up here and connect it with those that are receiving it. And so even though we communicate constantly via text, via email, via voice, via in person, many of us don't take the time to really understand how we're communicating and whether or not we're having the desired impact on others that we want to have. So what are some tips for having high impact communication? I know last, last segment you talked about really understanding the needs and what keeps people up at night. So there's obviously laying that foundation. But talk mm-hmm. me through that process of being able to get to a point where my, my communications are high impact. Well, there, there are many different elements. So there's not just one thing. Part of it is the message and part of it is the messenger. So last segment, we talked a little bit about clarity. We talked a little bit about making sure that your message resonates with those that you're speaking with by understanding what matters to them. But many of us have a distorted sense of how we come across to others. There's a lot of research out there that suggests that we always assess ourselves more positively. And as a result of that, we may not accurately assess what's going on with our listeners. So one of the tools that I've created is an assessment called Your Impact 360, which helps individuals and organizations get a better idea of how their people are affecting those that you interact with on a daily basis. Because even though in the business of architecture, one of the things that can be very costly for an organization is things like quality or reputation. But how many contacts does an individual within your organization make on a regular basis that could either have a positive or a negative impact on the organization's ability to get more work? We may communicate with others via phone, email, in person, between 20 and 50 times a day, internally and externally. And how people communicate affects an array of things. So the assessment, what it enables you to do is evaluate how you come across in a variety of communication contexts, one-on-one, in meetings, in formal presentations like project interviews, but it also enables you to better understand how your communication impacts the various relationship types that may be around you in each of those contexts. For example, someone who is a supervisor, someone who is a peer, maybe a subordinate, maybe a 
long-standing client, maybe a new client, and each of those perspectives give us, us a clearer picture about the effectiveness of your communication. Because how we communicate varies depending on the context. We may communicate very clearly with our boss, but when it comes to communicating and giving instructions to our subordinates, we may not be that effective. But if your boss has only seen you communicate with them, they may assume that how you communicate with them is how you communicate with others, and it's not true. And the context changes how we communicate. So, you know, I, I look at, uh, there are so many assessments out there. Most of them for, that focus on communication and personality style put you in a box. They say, this is your type. But regardless of your personality type, the contextual elements affect how we communicate. And what my assessment does also is it doesn't say that it, it doesn't put you in a box. All it says is these are the areas that you can improve upon and everything within the assessment is improvable. Everything from body language to voice to clarity. All of those things, regardless of personality type, affect your ability to have high impact on others. And wouldn't you just like to know? It's kind of like don't you always want to know, you know, when you go into the restroom and you say, oh my gosh, I've had that spinach in my teeth for two hours and nobody told me. The same is true with our communication. It is very rare for people to tell you very clearly what you're doing that either is affecting them positively or potentially affecting them negatively. And we keep doing the same things over and over again unless somebody brings it to our awareness. How does someone go about getting this assessment, Hillary? The best thing to do is to go to our, my website, www.highimpactcommunication.com. You can also email me. Uh, there are ways that we can set it up, not just for an individual, but also for an organization. And uh, you know, any questions related to that, feel free to give me a call. But you know, being high impact requires you to know what you're doing and what needs to be changed. And this, this assessment that you offer is something that's conducted in person? Actually, the great thing is that it is web-based. So when we set that up for you or for your organization, people don't need to you know, do it live. They don't need to do it on paper. And they don't even need to do it all at once. They can do it over the course of a week as, as, you know, if they have time. The more important thing is the selection of the assessors. Who are the people that are going to provide us really good, useful feedback that's honest, that can help us help this individual who could be at any level of the organization to have the desired impact that they want to have. So, you know, we work with you to help identify, okay, who would be the best candidates to be a part of this assessment? And, you know, when we, the, the great thing about this assessment is unlike others where it's one and you're done, because I don't put you in a box, we can reassess certain elements of it to figure out how somebody has progressed because the the best thing that you can do is to focus on one or two elements that may need the most work and maybe focus on some other things later because when it comes to communication there's no such thing as perfection you know the good news and the bad news is we get the rest of our lives to become more effective as communicators but the bad news is is that if we don't do it now it could have a disastrous effect on not only our career, but also the organizations that we're a part of. Well, let's talk about that. So in, in the profession of architecture, what yes. I find, and perhaps you can agree with this or not, I find that a lot of architects are more on the introverted side. I don't know if that's yeah. the correct definition, but definitely, you know, being in an office drawing, not necessarily the backslapping, outgoing type of people. Mm -hmm. So what hope or what suggestions, is it possible to thrive uh, in a presentation situation when your normal personality is not to be gregarious, is not to be really loud and outspoken, mm -hmm. but is rather to be more of a listener and more of a quiet type of personality. What what can you say that, that can help a lot of our audience who have mm -hmm. that kind of personality trait be more effective when they're using, you know, trying to persuade people or trying to be perceived in a certain way? Well, first off, I, I appreciate that. I I recognize that for many creative people, designers, that they do a lot of internal processing. They're, 
they're visual. They're not necessarily verbal, which is why they chose this profession. Part of the reason why introverts don't feel good about communicating or or sharing their ideas is that lack of confidence is they they feel like they express themselves best visually and it doesn't require to, you to be an extrovert in fact um on the myers-briggs personality test i am actually an infj so i'm more of an introvert than i am an extrovert and i've worked with introverts for such a long time and i too have felt the discomfort of sharing my voice and, and, and speaking in front of others. When, when I was younger, I was a part of the University of Texas speech team, but I was doing things like performance of literature. So it's more like acting. So I get to say words somebody else wrote and pretend like I'm somebody else. But my team, my, my coaches said to me, we really want you to do an informative speech. I'm like, would I have to write that? And then I, I have to be up there as me. And it would, you would have thought they had asked me to jump out of a plane with a parachute. I was petrified. So I have had that fear, that horrible fear. And so I can relate to it and I can appreciate it. I don't dismiss it. I don't, I don't minimize that sensitivity. But an introvert is a, is a, is a beautiful human being. And being an effective communicator does not require somebody to be an extrovert. In fact, I find some of the most effective communicators are actually introverts because they have tend to have a greater sensitivity and the greater ability to key into what matters to others. So I don't want anybody to ever feel like being an introvert is a disadvantage. In fact, it's an asset. Now, I, I worked with a young woman who uh, was part of the the American Council of Engineering Companies leadership development program. And every year in the state of Arizona, the, the local, uh, the, the firms will submit candidates to be a part of this program. And this young woman, you know, first of all, she's a young female in engineering, which, you know, can be a little bit uncomfortable at times, but she was also very self-conscious. One of the early exercises involved each person getting up to the front of the room and telling about themselves. And when she got up there, she looked down, her, she was, she, she, her body language was such that she was trying to cover herself up and didn't want to be seen. And through the course of this program and her commitment to continuing to, you know, break through that discomfort, about a year later, uh, the, her, her boss came up to me at a networking event. He said, you are not going to believe this. And he mentioned her name and he said, she just made a presentation to the city of Phoenix and they said it was the best that they had ever seen. And I tell that because, you know, a lot of folks don't realize the work that it can take to become effective. We just see our discomfort and we often see people who have had more experience than we do and we're comparing ourselves to them. So the biggest thing that, that introverts can do is stop comparing yourself to anybody else because you're a work in progress and you have great ideas. And the, the, the reason why you communicate them is because the ideas that you bring forth into this world change lives. So bring them forth. They should be voiced. If they always stayed inside of you, our world would be a much you know, it would, would, would be much worse for it. The reason that you're here is because of the ideas that you create. My job is to help you communicate them using a different medium, which is words, as opposed to just images. Hillary, I, I do a certain amount of, fair amount of speaking uh, engagements where I'm in front of people and people always come up to me and say, oh, you know, that was wonderful, whatever. But no one would actually ever guess that when I was in elementary school, I was so terrified about talking to people that mm. I literally, I literally wet my pants in front of my class because mm. I was scared to ask the teacher to take a potty break. Okay. Mm. So my question for you is, how do you take someone like that who's literally petrified of what other people think or mm. talking to other people and then turn them into someone who's able to communicate more effectively? and be more impactful as a communicator? 
Well, there are so many different elements that affect that. One of them is one that you mentioned, having an experience at a very young age that had, had an, a, a very dramatic impact on your sense of self. And those things linger with us. They really do. And sometimes it can be difficult to share those experiences with coworkers or people that we see every day. And that's why having somebody on the outside that's a coach to really work through that because carrying that with you forward, the only thing that keeps it alive is you, is, is inside your head. And, you know, not the, to d- diminish the, the trauma of that event, but how long do you want to take it with you? And the, what would you say to that, that kid now? You know, so there's so many different ways we can work together to, first off, eliminate some of the psychological and emotional barriers that are keeping you from your full potential. Then we can start working on things like messaging, and then we can start working on things like delivery. But when, when we get rid of that, that you know, potato sack that you're dragging behind you that is keeping you in, in a place of emotional vulnerability, you know, it may not go away completely, but if we can just minimize it, if we can make it so that it doesn't get in the way of your ability to, to communicate some things that, that only you in this world can do. <laughs> well, I hope my listeners got a little laugh out of that. I mean, that was yeah. many, many years ago. It used to be my most embarrassing moment. Now it's probably one of my funniest moments that I share. But, but aren't you grateful now that you, it happened? Because the fact that it happened probably challenged you and you said, no, I am, I am going to be able to do this. Mm. And in well, when- spite of that, yeah, when you yeah. gave the example of the of the lady who went from being uh, body language that was very closed up and very mm-hmm. uh, inconfident of herself or her self image, and then went to being one of the people who they said it was one of the best presentations she had, mm-hmm. in my own little head, I, I was thinking that that's probably because she had to try harder than other people to whom it came naturally, and so mm-hmm. maybe that put her ahead of the pack. Is that the case? Yeah, you know, that can really happen. That can happen sometimes because sometimes people for whom it's relatively easy don't feel like they need any work. And so those that, that work for it pay more attention to the details. They, they decide that there's something within them that they want to accomplish, whereas those that, for whom it comes easy, they go, okay, well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to worry about this. But I'll tell you, the ones that typically – will go rogue on a, on a project interview are not the ones that are the most uncomfortable. It's the ones that think they know it all mm. and think they don't have any room for improvement. <laughs> I've done that too, but that's another story. <laughs> all right. Mm-hmm. So Hillary, give me some very actionable steps. You know, you looking out at this young lady who as she was involved in some coaching and then she had this dramatic turnaround, you know, mm-hmm. what specifically are some things that our listeners could do to, progress in this particular area of communication? Well, communication is a very broad area. Uh, part of it is understanding where, you, where things are working and where they're not. So that's why the assessment is really helpful. Once we have an understanding of that, let's say that you're great one-on-one, you're great in meetings, but something happens in presentations that... Yeah, let, let's use presentations for an example because yeah. I think a lot of people, that's maybe where they would want to focus is the actual presentations. Right. So usually the first thing that is keeping somebody somebody from being effective is what's going on up here because they are able to point your head, right? So for our listeners, yeah, it's in, inside your mind. Mm-hmm. It's inside your mind. So if somebody is good one on one, good in meetings, there's something that shifts in their mind which keeps them from being equally effective. So we have to to break that down and figure out what the source of that is. The other thing is, is stop being afraid of the things that make you uncomfortable. Instead of avoiding them, do it more often. There's a, a, a psychological theory called exposure therapy. And what that means is whatever scares you, you need to get it in front of you frequently. So its power diminishes. For example, I, um, I am not very fond of heights and went to the Disney parks and see this big roller coaster and see this tower of terror thing. And I'm like, oh my God, that's no, 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 no. You know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to die. 
I'm going to die. And then, then the rational mind also goes, if you could die, Disney would not have it open. So you can't die. And I said to myself, you know, how often do I ask my clients to get outside of their comfort zone and to work through some of those things that maybe they're afraid of? So I said, okay. And I set myself up on a plan with the roller coaster. I said, okay, so the first time I go on the roller coaster, I keep my eyes closed, I hold on for dear life, and I just focus on not throwing up. That's my first goal. And that's similar to presentations. Most people want to get through it and just not throw up. But don't close your eyes because you got to communicate. The second thing you do, so, so the second time I got on the roller coaster, I said, okay, so every so often I'll just kind of open my eyes slightly and then I'll hold on. Until eventually I could keep my eyes open the whole time. But having little goals for yourself as opposed to, to, to the big goal is important. You know, don't focus on, okay, in, in one month, I'm going to be an extraordinary public speaker. Set realistic goals for yourself. But also, it doesn't take a whole speech to practice and get comfortable with presenting. I recommend that folks prepare something like a one to two minute story about a success that maybe they've had on a past project, something going on in their life and get up and present it. Uh, and by doing that on a regular basis, maybe once a week, maybe even if you can't you know, find a, find a buddy in the office or um, maybe go into um, the conference room and invite a couple of people to give you some feedback and record it so that you can not just have a document to record your progress, but also so that you can look at yourself and go, huh, I'm making progress and have that validation to help you keep going. But doing it on a regular basis is the best thing that you can do. Fantastic. Hillary, I'd like to transition. You have two books on your website, Selection Success and More Selection Success. What will those books teach us? So Selection Success is a collaborative effort with me and a woman by the name of Lori Stanley, who was the contracts administration officer for the city of Phoenix for almost 20 years. She was very instrumental in shifting from just the hard bid option for municipalities to alternate delivery methods. And so at the time, there wasn't really anything like this out there. So we collaborated on some best practices to help individuals and organizations from start to finish on how to be more successful in the selection process. The second book, More Selection Success, was is a follow-up to it and has some additional tips and ideas that I learned since authoring the first book. And there's always a ton of new ideas and uh, topics that I address on my blog on the website. Give us a couple of ideas from the first book, Selection and Success, that you uh, developed with your co-author. Well, this is one that, that people always ask me about, so I'll bring this one up. The question is, what do you give a selection panel before your presentation? Do you give them handouts? Do you wait until the end? Part of that's going to depend on the client because some clients will say, we don't want you to give us anything. Now, when they allow it, Lori, who sat on many a selection committee, says, I want copies of the slides and I want two per page so that I can write notes on each one. And what that enables me to do is write less because, you know, I've already got it in front of me. My thought coming into this was, why give your audience anything that's going to distract them during your presentation. She responded by saying, well, if they're going to be distracted, at least they're looking at your stuff. So we kind of have differences of opinion on that. A lot of it really just depends on the client. You know, she likes to have those, those 
slides two at a time. So if you know your client, if you know what makes it easier for them to focus on connecting with your presenters, that'll help you determine what you may utilize visually to help reinforce that message with them. All right, give me some other tips for selection success. Okay, so one of the other ones that's essential is I find that many organizations only practice question and answer if they have time. So many teams that I that I have worked with, especially early on, they would doctor up slides so much, mostly to just avoid having to get up and talk it through. The problem is the slides are not what's going to win you the job. It's your people. Are they coming across as confident, competent? Do they seem to know their project? Do they have passion in you know, the opportunity that's before them? So practicing Q&A is essential, but also making sure that the team gets practice time together as a collective to voice what they want to say. There's a big difference between what, what you say in your mind and what comes out of your mouth. How many times have you thought of something that you were going to say and then you actually said it and you were like, ooh, that didn't sound nearly as good. That happens all the time. It always sounds better in your mind than it does coming out of your mouth, which is why you have to practice so that you have more confidence in your ability to say what you want to say in the way that you say it so that you don't feel like you put the shoe in your mouth. But with regards to Q&A, the best time to start working on Q&A is after you submit your proposal. Don't wait until the shortlist notification letter comes out. You don't need it. Focus on just answering the questions after the proposal gets submitted, and that'll buy you time later on because for a lot of these interviews, in fact, I did one just last week where 50% of the score came from questions and 50% of the score came from the prepared presentation. Well, if you spend all your time on the prepared presentation and assume that the Q&A is just going to go right, it's very risky. So how do you practice Q&A? Well, have somebody with some technical competence review the proposal and maybe come up with some questions. Look through any information you have about past interviews with this client and maybe what they asked in the past. Uh, I like to keep an ongoing collection of these questions to utilize with clients. And even though people answer questions every day, they may not be answering them effectively. So practicing it is essential. One of the things that is often asked is to give a story or an example of something that happened on a past project. Let's say, let's say the question is, um, tell me about a lesson learned on a past project that you would bring to bear on ours. Well, the, there, are two, there are two things that will have the highest likelihood of coming to mind either the most recent or the most painful in your past. Now, the most painful may not show or demonstrate your heroics or paint you in a good light. If it's a Titanic story, meaning the ship went down, everybody died, those you don't want to share with clients. Because of that, it's essential that you build a repertoire of good stories and examples for clients and for these interviews. I have a, a formula that ensures that people's stories stay tight and focused only on what matters to the moral of the story or the point. So the formula goes like this. Part one is what was the situation? Help me understand the context in which this arose. What are the elements on that project that may be similar to something that may be on this project? Element number two, how did you solve it? Part number three, what was the outcome? The outcome always has to be, yay, it was phenomenal beyond what anybody could think. If you get to the outcome and it was like, well, yeah, I, yeah, maybe I'll do better next time. You need to find another story. 
The fourth part is really essential, and a lot of people skip this. And what is the moral of the story? And by that, I mean, what is the takeaway that you want the this 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 client to to take away? Is it that you know, as a project manager, I'm always looking for creative ways to save you money? Is it that you know, whatever that moral is, that's what you want them to take away? You can never assume that they'll get the moral of the story, which is why you need to state it clearly. So yes. Big thing that I encourage is ongoing story collection, ongoing you know feedback on those stories to determine if it's an, if it's appropriate, if it's effective, so that you don't just let it to be to chance and hope that in a stressful situation in front of a client when a big deal is on the line, someone magically is able to articulate what they need to. Can you give me an example, Hillary, of a time that you were working with a client? when they were able to do uh, either through finding out the client's true needs, but they were able to have some sort of big win or reverse the situation or something really cool and dramatic happened. Mm. Let's see. Which one, which one do I pick? Right. Uh, uh, so I was working with a client and this is for actually, it was a constructor for a big data center and going into this, they had they had already done some work with the client, but the competition was very, very fierce. And we knew from intelligence that the client was like, well, you know, even though, you know, we had a positive experience with you, you know, there's a part of us that feels like maybe we need to like share the work. Or, and so we were aware of this going in. And so we really had to be very strategic about, okay, what what could we do? What could we say that would ensure that they go, you know what? Now's really not a good time for us to make a change. If we've already got a, a, a proven team, we really need to do that. So our team was going to be going very last. And there were two teams that presented in the morning. The selection panel was going to lunch and then our team was coming in. So one of the things that we we determined was that we really needed to strike an emotional chord with the panel and remind them of the success that we'd already had with them. So we began the presentation by stating the date that the data center opened last time, you know, because everybody in that room was there. So do you remember when da 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 da? And and so it forced them to remember the feeling that they felt that day. And that can be very powerful. People make decisions m more often on feeling than they do reason. Most major decisions in our, our life weren't done from the intellect. There was a feeling there first, then we justified it based on our mind. So I bought that car, yeah, was it the most economical? Did it have the best gas mileage? No, I just liked it. There was something about it that I felt a kinship with and I justified my decision based on some other things. The same is true with, with any decision that human beings make. So knowing your client, knowing what's going to hit them, not just intellectually, but emotionally, you, you, that, that's essential. Afterwards, so we did win the job. And afterwards, in talking with the client, we discovered they went to lunch and at that lunch, they said, wow, that first team that we saw today, unbelievable. We're definitely going with them. And so they felt like their decision was made before even listening to my client. And afterwards, they said, you know what? We honestly didn't think that it was possible for another team to blow us out of the water after what we saw. So that's very powerful. And again, it's a lot about knowing the client, knowing what matters to them, and also trying to figure out, okay, what can we bring that nobody else can bring? Fantastic. So Hillary, I put you on the spot. You gave the example of you need to tell stories and I asked you for a story. You delivered. So good job. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> well, I have to practice what I preach. That's right. So just a little, we'll finish up with something tactical here. 
first, second, okay. last. What do you recommend? What's the best? Is there like a best way to go when you're going into a presentation? Is it better to go first or is it better to go last? What's your feeling on that? There is research out there that suggests suggest that there's a law of primacy and recency where we tend to remember what was first or last better. At the same time, I tend to diminish that when it comes to my clients because if they think, oh, we're going third, we might as well not show up. No. I mean, if you allow your starting, your position to in any way either make you feel better or worse about your presentation, you're already at a disadvantage. So my thing is just be the best because when you're the best, it won't matter. Just be the best because if you're last and if you are horrific, they will really, really remember that and they will probably remember that the next time they go in to read your proposal and potentially invite you back. So just put it, you know, put everything in there, do your best and be memorable. That's it. Don't let anything psych you out about, yeah, it's, it, yeah. No, don't worry about it. Hillary, where should people go to connect with you and your work further? Well, they can give me a call at 602-795-5400. They can also email me, Hillary, spelled H-I-L-A-R-I, at high, H-I-G-H, impact, I-M-P-A-C-T, communication.com. And then they can also visit my website. They can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Hillary Weinstein, thank you for being on the business of architecture. Oh, it was a pleasure. Anytime. Love right, to visit bye-bye. with you. Bye. And that is a wrap. Thank you for listening today. If you're looking for more time, freedom, impact, and income as an architect, get instant access to my free four-part architect profit map by visiting freearchitectgift.com. The sponsor for today's show is ArchReach, the client relationship management tool built specifically for architects. If you want to systematize your marketing and business development, ArchReach will help you do it. Visit archreach.com to learn more. expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.